and you are. So thanks everybody for your patience. We're up and running. We have a bigger screen now, so everybody should be able to see a little bit better. Okay, so um, we have one more presenter, then we're going to do our Q&A for all of our speakers this morning. Um, but before we get there, um, we have Dr. Uh, Daleander, who is here from USGS, and um, she's going to be talking about these um, surface residual balls or these tar balls and how they move around in these nearshore environments. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. So um, my name is Sippy Daylander. I work for the USGS in St. Petersburg. Anybody who caught the, the seminar a couple weeks ago is going to look familiar, so try and find things you, you don't remember from before. Um, but to give you a little background, I work, uh, the part of USGS I work for is in the Coastal Marine Geology Program, like I said. So what we study is what are the, um, how does sand move around on the beach, things like hurricanes impact the coastal areas. And so my background is actually in sediment transport. And all that means is how does sand or other objects move around in the beach. And so you'll see why, um, where, how we got involved based on, on that background. USGS, if you're not familiar with it, we're a federal science agency. We're actually prohibited by law from having any regulatory authority. We can't tell anyone to do anything. That's on purpose to keep the, the science to, uh, from being influenced. We don't have a dog in the race, so a dog in the fight. So that's, uh, that's our role is to provide science that uh, really informs uh, managers, resource managers, uh, natural hazards um, response and so forth um, that really benefits the public good, but we focus on the science end of it. And so I'm not going to go into uh, uh, too much detail on stuff that's already been covered, but uh, sand and oil agglomerates is what we call them. So you hear these things called tar mats or tar balls. There's actually a reason I don't call them that. Um, so when we were first brought in to look at this, you know, I'm a scientist. The first thing I do, I go into to Google Scholar, I do a lit review, right? I look to see what, what, do, what do people already know about this. And I type in tar balls, and there's tons of publications. This is great. And so I look at them, and they're all about tar balls, literally balls of tar that float. And so all this wonderful research about how these things move around and what they do is useless to me because these things don't float that, that are left over from Deepwater Horizon. Um, so in the surf zone, we've kind of heard oil and sand mixed to form these dense agglomerates. So, so we call them uh, SOAs. You can also uh, submerged oil mats are big ones. Surface residual balls are small ones. It's a size distinction, but they're all basically made of the same stuff. So these sand and oil mats, some of them could be tens of meters long or a couple cent and, uh, centimeters thick. Smaller pieces can break off or they can form in situ, and they're a little bit more mobile. And that's what I'm going to be talking about. And so this is, you've seen pictures like this now several times, so that's all on that. You heard about the SCAT technique that goes out and assesses where, where oiling occurred. Um, the Coast Guard went out and removed material where possible, where it wasn't going to be ecologically worse to, to bring in the equipment to do so. Um, but it kept coming back, at the, uh, it kept coming back, and they wanted to know why. And so some of my thunder got stolen previously because we were brought in at the time of the, the spill and not much was known about the dynamics. And now, thanks to research we've done, other folks have done, more is known about the dynamics. And so this question of why it kept, kept coming back at the time prompted the Federal On-Scene Coordinator to charter the Operational Science Advisory Team, or OSAT. And that's where we, Coastal Marine Geology, were brought in because these, particularly the SRVs, like I said, I study sand and sediment, how stuff moves around, and they wanted to know how these things moved around. And so we were brought in to try and help inform response. Could we make response better? So the key questions that they had for us, where could mats still remain? If we find SRVs, does that mean there's a mat right there that we should go out and be looking for? Where is it all eventually going to go? And a big one, why do we keep finding these things in areas that we've already cleaned? Obviously, that's very frustrating. So the question of where can maps be hidden, and you heard a little bit about uh, mention of the buried oil project. And so this was an uh, uh, attempt to identify where maps could still remain. And so the two pieces to that are where could they have formed in the first place, right? You know, if you want to know where they still remain, you need to know where they started. The other question is, are there areas where they couldn't still remain because nature would have done the dirty work for us? and broken the mats apart. So this first part was where we came in. Where could they have formed? And so in the case of um, sand and oil agglomerates, it's actually the sand that's the limiting factor. These things are 70 plus percent sand, as you've seen. And so if you're out too deep 
the oil, the oil moves at the surface, the sand is, is at the bottom, there's not sand and oil in contact to form this form of residual oil. That doesn't mean other things can't be going on out there, but in terms of this particular form of residual oil. We did um, numerical modeling to look at where you actually would have enough sand in contact with oil in order to form these things. And you get it in the swash zone, this is sort of intuitive, right? You have the water and the oil on top of the water right in contact with the sand. You have a lot of energy, you have a lot of mixing. That's where you get some map formation in SRBs. You can actually also get them under breaking waves. So when you have breaking wave conditions, you have a lot of uh, sand being pulled up from the bottom. You have the oil mousse getting pulled down to, to, uh, down to deeper. It can mix and so you can get um, this formation. But outside of the surf zone, you're not going to get them because, again, it's, it's going to be sand limited. And so we didn't do the second part of it, but the second part was to say, all right, now we know where they, they could have formed, where could they still remain? And that was done using um, aerial imagery and uh, stereo ortho imagery. So they looked at, as, as you heard before, the beach was in an erosional state in most places um, when deep water rise and happened. And so sand tended to come back anywhere where that happened and oil mats could have formed was a potential location to look for these things. And they actually found several by, by doing that, by looking in these locations where there had been accretion. If, in, on the flip side, if you have an area where you had oil deposited and now it's eroded, so the level of the bed is below where it was before, again, nature's done your dirty work. It's taken out the mat. They may have formed SRBs from it, but there's not going to be a big mat there because it's not, the, 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 the surface where it was is now gone. So the second part of, of our work and, and the bulk of our work was related to these SRBs. And again, these are the questions that were response was, was most concerned with. And we looked at this with a numerical model. Um, because as you've heard, it's very hard observationally to go out and find these things and, and see them. And so by using a numerical model and using our understanding of, of the dynamics of, of sand and similar materials, we could actually answer some of these questions. And so we built a numerical model This uh, models wind, waves, and current. So when you're in the surf zone, when waves come in at an angle, they break and they drive a longshore current that goes in, in, the, um, in one direction. And so this is the area that we modeled. You can see it covers from Alabama into the panhandle of Florida. There's another group that used the techniques we developed and applied it in Mississippi and Louisiana, but we, our model didn't extend that far to the west. Um, and like I said, from this we know um, the wave conditions and the currents. One thing we did that was a little unique with this was normally when people like me do this, we do what's called a time series run. So we say, all right, I care about what happened from you know, September of 2010 to November of 2010. I look at the exact winds that happened then and I, I'd run my model and, and so my computer tells me what's going on. But that wasn't really what we wanted to do here because number one, we wanted to know the future and I can't tell you exactly what's gonna happen in the future. And we also would have been very, uh, it would, we don't have a big enough computer, basically. The computational expense is too great to run the period of time we cared about. So instead what we did is we looked at uh, scenarios. So we looked at all the wave conditions in the Gulf, and we looked at the different wave heights, wave directions, and we created a set of 80 scenarios that captured the variability. And so now the neat trick I can do is in the past, I can take and at any given time, I can match up what that time looks like in my scenarios and basically like build from these set of scenarios a time series. But I can also look in the future. I can look at what the average conditions are. What's the long-term, you know, end conditions as far as what the currents look like, where, where the uh, areas of current convergences are, things like that. All right, so now if I know if my computer can tell me what the, the, the currents and the waves look like, what does that mean for the SRBs? And so SRBs, anything on the seafloor, moves when what's called the shear stress exceeds a critical value. All shear stress is is that when you have liquid flowing over a, a surface, it, can, it gives a, a lifting force. And so how hard something is to move, it depends on how dense it is, makes sense, right, how heavy it is, and how big it is. Bigger things are harder to move, denser things are harder to move. So by comparing what the model is saying the, the exerted stress is to what the critical values are for these SRBs, I can tell you when they're moving, and because of the currents, I can tell you the direction that they're heading. And so this was the classes we looked at. We looked at sand, just the, the sediment, uh, natural sediment, and then we looked at six size classes of SRB, ranging from a sand-sized little guy up to a 10-centimeter SRB. The other thing we looked at was integrated alongshore potential flux. This is a big phrase, right? All it means is that I can't tell you exactly where SRBs are going 
because I can't tell you exactly where they started. We know it covered a large extent of uh, Florida to Louisiana, but I can't tell you where one particular one started, so I can't track it through my model exactly where it went. But what I can tell you is, and this makes sense, right, it's very basic, if currents are going this way in one location and currents are going this way in the other location, here's a good place to look. Similarly, you know, in the middle where those two converge. Similarly, if you have flow going in one direction and that's starting to slow down, that's another area where, where this decelerating flow, that, that would be an area you'd expect to see these things. And so those were areas that we were looking for. So these are some of our results. This is, um, you're going to see a few of these plots. So all this is is the ratio of the exerted stress, the force that's put going on these things, to the critical value to move them. So if this number is bigger than one, stuff's moving. If it's less than one, stuff's not moving. If it's greater than one, it's going to be in a really hot pink color. So that it's really easy to see. These are under the small wave conditions that are common in the Gulf of Mexico. Um, this is for natural sand sediment going up to two and a half centimeter SRBs and 10 centimeter SRBs. And what you can see, it's really easy to see, is that under these small wave conditions, the big SRBs aren't moving anywhere. Similarly for the two and a half centimeter SRBs. Sand, on the other hand, can move in the surf zone. It's, this is intuitive. You go out to the beach, you see sand moving around even when the waves are little. So sand is more mobile than SRBs, and that's actually important. Like I said, some of this is now known, but at the time, they weren't sure how mobile these things were. And so there wasn't a lot of understanding that these smaller pieces could be buried and exhumed. So they could be buried and unburied with shifting sand. But because they are less mobile than sand under normal conditions, small wave conditions, that's a process that's going on. What about big waves, storm waves? This doesn't necessarily need to be a hurricane or a tropical storm. This could be a winter storm front that comes through. Well, sand is moving everywhere on the shelf, and this is consistent. We, we, uh, this, this is something that's well known. If the model didn't say this, this would be a problem. Um, it's moving out along the shelf. But now you're starting to see some movement of the SRVs, um, two and a half centimeters in the surf zone, and it's hard to see at the scale, but even the 10 centimeters in the surf zone can move. And so during storm events, what can happen is these larger SRVs um, can, can start to move a little bit along shore, but then under uh, smaller wave conditions, the sand is moving and the SRVs aren't, so that's when you can get a lot of this burial and, and unburial. So again, this is the, the results of our study, um, that they're not mobilized during low energy wave conditions, but they are um, uh, mobilized under storm conditions. And this actually explains something that the Coast Guard had seen um, and they were, couldn't quite explain, was that when they go out after a storm, they wouldn't collect a lot of these things, which is counterintuitive, right? Everybody assumes that after the storm, you know, these things break up and they'll, they'll show up. And so they kept saying, why are we not finding these? And what it is is that during a storm event, you have a lot of sand come up in suspension. You have these larger SRBs. They start to move around a bit. Now the conditions start to die down, and the sand's falling out of suspension again and covering them with a light amount of material. So you go out there and look, you don't see them. But over time, and this takes maybe about a week, the sand uh, starts to get brushed off the top of the SRBs because the sand is moving and the SRBs aren't, and you find a ton. So you get a spike about a week later. And so when they go out and they find these things, and they say, we found a bunch of these things, and there wasn't a storm. You say, was there a storm a week ago? Yes. So that's, that's a mechanism by which these things can uh, explain some of what they were seeing. Again, we looked at potential flux, which this is just looking at what is the, the, the general directions of, of flows or fluxes of these things so we can find areas. I can't tell you the exact amount, but I can tell you spatially where they're more likely to accumulate. And so again, where you have a convergence of flow is an area where you're more likely to have them, or if you have a deceleration where stuff is slowing down, stuff's going to be tending to, to, to start to stop moving and fall out of the, the suspension sand. So these are some results. These are, this is for the Mobile Bay, so Alabama into Florida, and this is for two different wave conditions. So the white arrow shows the direction of the incident waves. So at the top panel, this is a, a waves coming in fairly oblique to the coast. The dots along the coast, if they're green, it's eastward flow. If they're um, red, it's westward flow. And you can see that when the waves are coming in from this angle, you've got westward flow. Well, westward flow pretty much all along the coast. And that's the dominant direction of sediment transport, longshore sediment transport in the northern Gulf. So if you average everything, this is mostly what it looks like in, in most places. But under some conditions, if the waves start to come in a little bit more uh, shore normal, 
you can have a much more complicated pattern. And so you can see, so here we've got westward flow, you've got this complicated pattern. So for example, here right near us, you've got where we are now, you've got this flow to the west, flow to the east on either side of Pensacola Pass, indicates a convergence um, at Pensacola Pass. And this is actually an area that we persistently um, saw. So under many wave conditions, this was something that, that an area that showed this. Whereas other areas, um, again, you can see convergences and divergences, but it depends on the, the particular wave conditions. Uh, we looked at inlets. So this is Little Lagoon um, Inlet. So this is Mobile Bay. It's on the coast of Alabama. Um, it's a small uh, inlet. And again, this is one of these plots where, where it's pink, it means stuff is moving. And when it's not pink, it means stuff uh, is not moving. And this is for a two and a half centimeter SRB. And so what you can see on flood tide is you have a pathway all the way through the channel where these things are mobilized. So if they're moving along, they can get into the inlet. But on ebb tide, um, there's flow asymmetry. The flow looks different on the ebb than on the, uh, on the flood. And you actually have a gap now where they're not mobilized. Well, if something can get in and it can't get out, you just made a trap. Um, so inlets can serve as traps for SRBs. And we see this, I looked at uh, several different inlets. And again, because of the, the way uh, flow patterns tend to be flood to ebb, inlets make pretty efficient traps for SRBs. So this is a summary of the numerical model results. The greater mobility of sand than SRB makes burial and exhumation likely. Like I said, you've heard people say that at the time. This is something that wasn't necessarily well known or wasn't known at all um, because most of the work that looked at um, tar balls had looked at these floating things, which move in an entirely different way. Um, larger SRBs are unlikely to move along shore outside of storm events, but under storm events, they can start to move. We generated these long-term distribution patterns. So we looked at what the patterns were over time. But basically, the bottom line is it would take a long time to reach that distribution pattern because, as I said, it depends on the wave conditions. And these things, because they get buried and unburied, when they're buried, they're not moving around. So it extends the time scale over which they could be found. And it also prohibits them from eventually reaching this long-term distribution pattern because when they are uncovered, they're going to move by whatever the wave conditions happen to be at that time. They also tend to be picked up or collected. Uh, lastly, the, the inlet service traps for SRBs, and so that's an area that uh, would be expected to be uh, an area that you find more over time because of that mechanism. So we took all our results, put it in GIS format um, so that it was accessible um, to the, the, uh, the managers looking at this and the responders looking at this. And so this is our website that has all of that. Um, all of our data is online as far as wave heights and currents. Um, it's been used actually to look uh, uh, at some other things related to the, the oil spill. And the methodology itself can be applied anywhere. So obviously the scale of Deepwater Horizon was unique, but in uh, talking to folks since then uh, and, and talking with, uh, you know, for example, regional response team out in California, they, they see this form of residual oil in other places. And again, let's get back to this terminology thing that sounds kind of silly, calling them tar balls versus not, but they didn't realize it was something different. And they didn't realize that you couldn't, you couldn't necessarily treat it the same way and that these things were coming buried and unburied because they're dense. And so that's, that's the only reason to be fussy about what they're called is to make sure that everybody knows what they're actually dealing with. So should you believe what, what I just told you? <laughs> no, of course you shouldn't. It just came off my computer. I could have made it up. <laughs> but because I'm a scientist, I will assess my model and I will tell you how well it's doing. So we did a model assessment or model validation. We didn't cheat. Um, in fact, we couldn't cheat. The Coast Guard didn't give us their data until after we'd given them our results. So we didn't tune the model. Um, starting in June of 2011, the Coast Guard collected some data about uh, uh, what they collected in terms of the pound and the shape. This is not SCAT data, actually. This is collection data. So it was actually what was, what was picked up. Um, and like, so they kept track of you know, the amount, some basic information on shape, and they did this for SRBs and for map material. Um, they spatially delineated it um, in a longshore segment, about 250 meters. This data was invaluable. I can't emphasize enough. Obviously, it was not collected for scientific purposes, but having this and then being able to do this and not, you know, didn't really impede what they were doing was really, really helpful for us to be able to, to, to look at what we were doing. So there's some limits because it wasn't a scientific data set, but it was really, really valuable. So I'll just show you uh, one plot of that. So this is the longshore variability going from west to east of the total mass of SRBs that were collected as of, I think this is 2013. Um, you'll see the dashes are the inlets because of that trapping mention, uh, mechanism I mentioned and because the, in between the inlets are here from Joel, they're isolated systems. Um, you don't expect them to cross. 
And so you, when you look into um, each of these, are called littoral cells between the, the inlets. In most cases, you see a, a gradual increase. This is over the course of, of you know, this is two years worth of data going from east to west, which is consistent with the patterns that we were predicting. Like I said, the dominant uh, direction of the longshore transfers to the west here. You can also see the triangles are around um, collection points that were in inlets. And you can see that, like the model predicted, you get increased collection, particularly at Pensacola Pass, which like I said was an area that had these persistent convergences, Little Lagoon, Mobile Bay. Oops, Perdido Pass didn't match. That really bugged us for a while because that was inconsistent. Something was wrong. But what's going on there is that Perdido Pass has two jetties that extend out from the front. They also close this off with a, a novel booming system uh, during the spill. So not as much oil got in, service oil got into the pass, and SRBs can't bypass these jetties. So you can't serve as a trap as well nothing gets in there in the first place. And so that's what explains this, this uh, lower um, collection there. What we're doing now, so one of the things that we learned in responding to this is that a lot of what we have, a lot of the tools in our toolbox were developed for sound, and they weren't necessarily developed for these larger um, you know, objects like uh, SRBs. And we've done some work. We wanted to make sure, number one, how good are we doing with these tools, and how can we make these tools better? And so that's what we're working on now. We obviously don't want to put real sand and oil agglomerates out because for a very obvious reason. So we're making artificial ones out of um, paraffin wax and sand. We make them in different sizes and shapes and really get into, we, we deploy them in the surf zone and really get into to nailing down the formulations and the science behind this so that we're better prepared next time. So for example, one thing that I didn't talk about was cross shore transport, final deposition. And that's because we didn't feel confident on what we knew and being able to predict that, but we'd like to be able to next time. And so that's what we're working on. We also took these to a, a lab, so because in the, it's really hard to see things in the surf zone, I'd, this slide doesn't actually have the picture that, that this camera took, but you can imagine when you look underwater what it looks like. And we have some neat image processing tricks to try and find them. That's why they're so brightly colored, but they're still pretty hard to see. Whereas if we take them into a tank, it's relatively easy to see. And so what you can see, so this is uh, the, looking in from the side of a, a, a tank in a laboratory, the Naval Research Lab, and you can see these are sand waves moving uh, and burying them. This is something that we hadn't really uh, thought about that, that in the tank it looks like is an important process. You know, when you think of barrow, you might think about like scour forming around the edge and them being buried by a light layer of sand. They can also get swamped by features moving over them, and that's where you can get, like Scott was saying, a meter of sand on top. You know, this is just a small sand ripple moving over, but it's going to bury it in, in uh, you know, a few inches of sand. And what if that was a sandbar that moved over it? You'd have a, a large amount of sand on top. Um, we looked at the exhumation of them with this, and so this data is still being analyzed to, to improve these formulations. We also uh, one area that we identified that was really hard to understand what's going on was the slosh zone because you've got water, you've got you know water bore coming up and hitting them, you have pressure gradients. So that's another area we're trying to improve our model. So our conclusions: uh, the work we did for the buried oil project was to identify the offshore extent of possible map formation, so that by identifying where these things could have formed, they could look at changes in the um, bathymetry, changes in the topography, and identify where they might still be to, to focus where to look. Um, the greater mobility of sand than SRBs makes this burial and exhumation likely. Um, the larger SRBs are unlikely to move in storm events, but um, they can, or they're unlikely to move under, under lower wave energy conditions, but they can move around during storm events. We predicted these long-term distribution patterns, but because of burial and exhumation, this is going to take a long time to reach that pattern, um, if in fact it, it ever does, because of, again, once they get unburied, people start to collect them and so forth. Um, inlet service traps for SRBs, so finding a bunch of SRBs in an inlet is not necessarily indicative of a, of a map located there. And then we validated our results against this Coast Guard uh, collection data. And so again, I think this, these publications, this presentation will be shared, so um, these will be hot linked, and these are the, the USGS and uh, public journal uh, articles that, are, that have more details on all of this stuff. Thank you.